Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and you've reached the Book of Mormon Lecture Series. I've been teaching seminary and institute for the last 11 years, and uh, this is an attempt to do a deep dive into the Book of Mormon itself. I'm hoping that you'll find this uplifting and edifying. This is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but every attempt has been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. So if you're ready for a deep dive into the Book of Mormon, here we go. Hi, and welcome back to the Book of Mormon podcast. This is going to be for Moroni chapter 7. I want you to notice a couple things here that as we get into this. Now, Moroni is going to write about the concepts of faith, hope, and charity. Remember that uh, he's already written about that in the book of Ether, but uh, he's going to include his father's uh, letter or talk in, in its entirety, which also covers faith, hope, and charity. He probably thought that his dad's uh, talk about that, even though he's already covered it, was probably better than his own. So that's why we have it twice in the Book of Mormon, once in Ether and once here. So let's go ahead and get started with this one. And now I, Moroni, <clears throat> write a few of the words of my father Mormon, which he spake, concerning faith, hope, and charity. For after this manner did he speak unto the people, as he taught them in the synagogue, which they had built for the place of worship. Now, and now I, Mormons, so this is like a transcript of his talk, general conference talk. This is the Ensign article, probably. And now I, Mormon, speak unto you, my beloved brethren, and it is by the grace of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy will because of the gift of his calling. Uh, so he's probably an apostle here, Mormon too, unto me that I am permitted to speak unto you at this time. Wherefore, I would speak unto you that are of the church. This talk was given to church members. It pertains to us today. That are the peaceable followers of Christ. Inner peace comes from Christ, even though we, even though the world around us may be in turmoil and at war and that have obtained a sufficient hope by which ye can enter into the rest. The fullness of God's glory is the rest of the Lord. From this time henceforth until uh, in the celestial kingdom, he means, ye shall rest from, with him in heaven. Joseph F. Smith taught that once the saints of God have gained a testimony which is unshakable and which will allow them to, com to confront the antagonists of the faith with confidence they have in this life entered into the rest of the Lord. Theirs is a settled conviction of the truth which comes through their hope in Christ and the faith that he will in time bestow upon them the riches of eternity. Verse 4, Now my brethren, I judge these things of you because of your peaceable walk with the children of men. Remember that this is occurring during the terrible wars between the Nephites and the Lamanites. For I remember the word of God, which saith by their works, ye shall know them. For if their works be good, then they are good also. For behold, God hath said a man being evil cannot do that which is good. For if he offereth a gift, or prayeth unto God, except he shall do it with real intent, it profiteth him nothing. Dallin Oaks said, Have you ever found yourself doing something you thought was right, but doing it because you had to? Did you ever keep a commandment of God with an attitude of resentment or self-righteousness or even because you expected some immediate personal benefit? I suppose most of us have had this experience. Do you remember your feelings on such occasions? Do you think such feelings will be ignored by a Father in Heaven who gave us the willpower we call agency? Don't such feelings tell us something about the desires of our hearts? Under the law of God, we are accountable for our feelings and desires as well as our acts. Evil thoughts and desires will be punished. Acts that seem to be good bring blessings only when they are done with real and righteous intent. On the positive side, we will be blessed for the righteous desires of our hearts, even though some outside circumstance has made it impossible for us to carry those desires into action. Verse 7, For behold, it is not counted unto him for righteousness. For behold, if a man being evil giveth a gift, he doeth it grudgingly. Wherefore, it is counted unto him the same as if he had retained the gift. Wherefore, he is counted evil before God. And likewise also, it is counted evil unto a man if he shall pray, and not with real intent of heart. Yea, and it profiteth him nothing, for God receiveth none such. Wherefore, a man being evil cannot do that which is good, neither will he give a good gift. Elder Oaks continues and says, People serve one another for different reasons, and some reasons are better than others. Perhaps none of us serves in every capacity all the time for only a single reason. Since we are imperfect beings, most of us probably serve for a combination of reasons, and the combinations may be different from time to time as we grow spiritually. But we should all strive to serve for the reasons that are our highest and best. Some may serve for hope of earthly reward. Others may serve in order to obtain worldly honors, prominence, or power. Another reason for service, probably more worthy than the first, but still in the category of service in search of earthly reward, is that motivated by a personal desire to obtain good companionship. These first two reasons 
for service are selfish and self-centered and unworthy of saints. Reasons aimed at earthly rewards are distinctly lesser in category or lesser in category. I'm sorry, boy, I said that twice. Reasons aimed at earthly rewards are distinctly lesser in character and reward than the other reasons I will discuss. Some may serve out of fear or of punishment. Some out of fear, service out of fear or puni of punishment is a lesser motive at best. Other persons may serve out of a sense of duty or out of loyalty to friends or family or traditions. Those who serve out of a sense of duty or loyalty to various wholesome causes are the good and honorable men and women of the earth. Service of the character I have just described is worthy of praise and will surely qualify for blessings, especially if it is done willingly and joyfully. There are still higher reasons for service. One such higher reason for service is the hope of an eternal reward. This hope, the expectation of enjoying the fruits of our labors, is one of the most powerful sources of motivation. As a reason for service, it necessarily involves faith in God and in the fulfillment of his prophecies. The last motive I will discuss is, in my opinion, the highest reason of all. It is the, it, In its relationship to service, it is what the scriptures call a more excellent way. Charity is the pure love of Christ. The Book of Mormon teaches us that this virtue is the greatest of all. If our service is to be most efficacious, it must be accomplished for the love of God and the love of his children. This principle, that our service should be for the love of God and the love of fellow men, rather than for personal advantage or any other lesser motive, is admittedly a high standard. Service with all of our heart and mind is a high challenge for all of us. Such service must be free of selfish ambition. It must be motivated only by the pure love of Christ. Verse 11, For behold, a bitter fountain cannot bring forth good fruit, neither can a good fountain bring forth bitter water. Wherefore, a man being a servant of the devil cannot follow Christ, and if he follow Christ, he cannot be a servant of the devil. Wherefore, all things which are good cometh of God, and that which is evil cometh of the devil. For the devil is an enemy unto God, and fighteth against him continually, and inviteth and enticeth to sin, and to do that which is evil continually. Hugh Nibley said, The devil is an enemy unto God, and fighteth against him continually, and inviteth, inviteth and enticeth to sin, that's his method, and to do that which is evil continually. So it's like a gravitational force, a continual force exerting steady pressure or attraction to pull you over into an orbit where you'll be invited to sin and do evil continually. On the other hand, you're continually being pulled in the opposite direction, but the same way inviting and enticing the same test. Wherefore, everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good and to love God and to serve him is inspired of God. Between the two, it's up to you. And the pull is equal. It has to be. Neither one is overwhelmingly powerful, not in this world. If God exerted irresistible force, which Joseph Smith says he will not do, then you would have no choice. I mean, it wouldn't be a test at all. As Peter says in the famous Clementine Recognitions, if God forced us to be good, there'd be no merit in that at all. On the other hand, if the devil was absolutely overpowering and you couldn't resist him, we wouldn't be responsible for yielding to him. He'd, he'd be too strong for us, so each of them has a mighty pull. The one, in the, the one is this direction and the other is phony, but it's mirror image of the other. There's a great early Christian literature in which the devil is an exact counterpart. He waits for God to act and then he acts. He makes the same claims to dominion. He is the fisherman of men too. He does all these other things. He sends out his missionaries. He has the same influence. And so it's up to you to make the choice. You're suspended in, in space between the two and you decide which direction you're going to move in. And again, that was by Hugh Nibley. Verse 13, But behold, that which is of God enti inviteth and enticeth to do good continually. Wherefore, everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good and to love God and to serve him is inspired of God. Once God is able to entice us to do good, then we are of service to him. These verses could easily be misunderstood. It is not that evil persons or persons with less than noble motives cannot do good things. They certainly can. It is just that their deeds prove in the end to be a blessing neither to themselves nor to those they serve. That is, so long as good deeds are motivated by selfish or malicious desires, they cannot transform and enrich either the giver or the receiver. Unfortunately, such doctrine has caused some members of the church to conclude, well, given the way I feel about, doing, uh, about going to church right now, or doing my home teaching, or serving at the cannery, I would be better to just stay home. 
No, it would be better to it would not be better to stay home. Giving a gift is one thing; performing my duties in the church is another. It is almost always better to do the right thing for the wrong reason than to than to do the wrong thing. Better to go to church or visit my families or show up for the welfare activity with a bad attitude than to remain at home. In most cases, the very act of doing my duty, even with a less than celestial motive, results in good feelings and subsequent gratitude for having done the right thing. And that was by Millard McConkie. And I think that as we practice doing the right things more often, we're going to like doing it better uh, more frequently. Verse 14, Wherefore take heed, my beloved brethren, that ye do not judge that which is evil to be of God, or that which is good and of God to be of the devil. For behold, my brethren, it is given unto you to judge that ye may know good from evil. And the way to judge is as plain that ye may know with a perfect knowledge as the daylight is from the dark night. Joseph Smith said, A person may profit by noticing the first intimation of the spirit of revelation. For instance, when you feel pure intelligence flowing into you, it may give you sudden strokes of ideas. Thus, by learning the Spirit of God and understanding it, you may grow into the principle of revelation until you become perfect in Christ Jesus. Verse 16 is a scripture mastery verse. For behold, the Spirit of Christ is given to every man that he may know good from evil. Wherefore, I show unto you the way to judge for everything which inviteth to do good and to persuade to believe in Christ is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. Wherefore, ye must know with a perfect knowledge it is of God. Elder McConkie said that Christ is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. This enlightenment is administered to all men through the Spirit of Christ, or the Spirit of the Lord, or the light of truth, or the light of Christ, all of which expressions are synonymous. This Spirit fills the immensity of space, is in all things, and is not to be confused with the personage of Spirit known as the Holy Ghost or Spirit of the Lord. The light of Christ is the Spirit of the Lord which leads men to accept the gospel and join the church so that they may receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Men are commanded to live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God, for the, mouth, for the word of the Lord is truth, and whatsoever is truth is light, and whatsoever is, truth, or whatsoever is light is spirit, even the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And the Spirit giveth light to every man that cometh into the world, and the Spirit enlighteneth every man through the world that, that hearkeneth to the voice of the Spirit. Those who hearken to this Spirit come into the church, receiving of the Spirit of Christ unto the remission of their sins. And every one that hearkeneth to the voice of the Spirit cometh unto God, even the Father. And the Father teacheth him of the covenant which he has renewed and confirmed upon you, which is confirmed upon you for your sakes, and not for your sakes only, but for the sake of the whole world. Now seeing that I know these things, why should I desire, this is Alma speaking, more than to perform the work to which I have been called? Behold, I answer for you, for our brethren the Lamanites were in darkness, yea, even in the in the darkest abyss. But behold now, but behold how many of them are brought to to behold the marvelous light of God. And this is the blessing which hath been bestowed upon us, that we have been made instruments in the hands of God to bring about this great work. And thus we see the great call of diligence of men to labor in the vineyards of the Lord. And thus we see the great reason of sorrow and also rejoicing, sorrow because of death and destruction among men, and joy because of the light of Christ unto men unto life. Men are born again by following the light of Christ to the point where they receive the actual enjoyment of the gift of the Holy Ghost. It is because of the light of Christ that all men know good from evil and enjoy the guidance of what is called conscience. And that was by Bruce R. McConkie. Verse 17, But whatsoever thing persuadeth men to do evil, and believe not in Christ, and deny him, and serve not God, then ye may know with a perfect knowledge it is of the devil. For after this manner doth the devil work. For he persuadeth no man to do good, no, not one, neither do his angels, neither do they who subject themselves unto him. And now, my brethren, seeing that ye know the light by which ye may judge, which light is the light of Christ, see that ye do not judge wrongfully. For with that same judgment which ye judge, ye shall be judged. We do not find this doctrine so clearly defined in the New Testament as in the Doctrine and Covenants of the Book of Mormon, but we discover this. The Lord has not left men, when they are born into this world, helpless, groping to find the light and truth, but every man that is born into the world is born with the right to receive the guidance, the instruction, the counsel of the Spirit of Christ, or light of truth, sometimes called the Spirit of the Lord, in our writings. If a man who has never heard the gospel will hearken to the teachings and manifestations of the Spirit of Christ, or the light of truth, which come to him, often spoken of as conscience, every man has a conscience and knows more or less when he does wrong, and the Spirit guides him if he will hearken to its whisperings, it will lead him eventually to the fullness of the gospel. 
That is, he is guided by the light, and when the, when the gospel comes, he will be ready to receive it. This is what the Lord tells us in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants. This spirit of truth, or light of Christ, also has other functions. We read this in the Revelation. This glory is that of the church of the firstborn, even of God, the holiest of all, through Jesus Christ, his Son, he that ascended up on high, as also he descended below all things, in that he comprehendeth all things, that he might be in all and through all things, the light of truth, which truth shineth. This is the light of Christ, as also he is in the sun, and the light of the sun, and the power thereof by which it was made, and as also he is in the moon, and is in the light of the moon, and the power thereof by which it was made, as also the light of the stars, and the power thereof by which they were made, and the earth also, and the power thereof, even the earth upon which you stand. And the light which shineth, which giveth you light, is through him who enlighteneth your eyes, which is the same light that quickeneth your understandings. Which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space? And that was by Joseph Fielding Smith. Verse 19, Wherefore I beseech of you, brethren, that ye should search diligently in the light of Christ. This is an unusual phrase. It seems to mean something like, be diligent in following the light of Christ, or search your hearts diligently and pay heed to the light, which with, or search diligently to know the truth, and then hearken to the quiet voice within you. That was by Millet and McConkie. <clears throat> Mormon's words indicate the need for effort on our part to obtain the real benefit of the light of Christ. While this gift is given to everyone, we must be willing to let that light guide and direct our decisions, or the light will grow dim. Speaking of this dwindling of the light of Christ, J. Reuben Clark explained, It is my hope and my belief that the Lord will never permit the light of faith wholly to be extinguished in any human heart, however faint the light may glow. The Lord has provided that there shall be still a spark with, with which uh, with teaching, with this, uh, let me say that again. The Lord has provided that there shall be, that there shall still be a spark, which, with teaching, with the spirit of righteousness, with love, with tenderness, with example, with living the gospel, shall brighten and glow again, however darkened the mind may have been. Continuing verse 19, that ye may know good from evil, and if ye will lay hold upon every good thing and condemn it not, ye certainly will be a child of Christ. And now, my brethren, how is it possible that ye can lay hold upon every good thing? And now I come to that faith of which I said I would speak, and I will tell you the way whereby ye may lay hold upon every good thing. For behold, God knowing all things, being from everlasting to everlasting, behold, he sent angels to minister unto the children of men, to make manifest concerning the coming of Christ, and in Christ there should come every good thing. Our God, the Almighty Elohim, is our Father in heaven, is a man, a glorified man, an exalted man of holiness, Joseph Smith explained in his famous King Follett sermon that there being whom that that being whom we now worship was once a mortal man who dwelt on an earth, even as we do now. How then can he be from everlasting to everlasting, or from eternity to eternity? Simply stated, this means from the spirit existence through the probation which we are in, and then back again to the eternal existence which will follow. And that was by Joseph uh, Fielding Smith. Uh, again, and also God always sends angels to his prophets when he wants to restore priesthood authority. Verse 23, And God also declared unto prophets by his own mouth that Christ should come. And behold, there were divers ways that he did manifest things unto the children of men, which were good, and all things which are good cometh of Christ. Otherwise, men are fallen, and there could be no good thing come unto them. Because we are fallen, we by ourselves could not do good. It is by the help of Christ that we do good. Wherefore, by the ministering of angels, isn't it interesting that Moroni is writing about angels when he is to be an angel himself in assisting with the restoration of the gospel in the last days? Very interesting, don't you think? And by every word which proceedeth forth out of the mouth of God, men began to exercise faith in Christ, and thus by faith they did lay hold upon every good thing, and thus it was until the coming of Christ. And after that he came, men also were saved by faith in his name. The pattern for salvation, the process of faith, was not different for those who lived in the meridian of time than for those who lived in the days of Adam some 4,000 years before, nor is it any different for those who lived 2,000 years after his coming in the flesh. Men and women must exercise faith in his name, repent of their sins, be reborn and renewed through his blood by, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, and endure faithfully to the end. In so doing, they prepare themselves to enjoy every good thing. Continuing the verse, and by faith they become the sons of God, and as surely as Christ liveth, 
he spake these words unto our fathers. Christ was taught to all the prophets, starting with Adam, saying, Whatsoever thing ye shall ask the Father in my name, which is good, and whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, which is right, believing that ye shall receive, behold, it shall be given unto you. And that was out of 3 Nephi. Um, in faith, believing that ye shall receive, behold, it shall be done unto you. Paul taught that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Joseph Smith elaborated on this principle when he taught, faith comes by hearing the word of God through the testimony of the servants of God. That testimony is always attended by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. That testimony may be borne by mortals or by angels. In the earliest ages of the world, the gospel began to be preached from the beginning, being declared by holy angels sent forth from the presence of God, and by his own voice, and by the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 27, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, have miracles ceased, because Christ hath ascended into heaven, and hath sat down on the right hand of God, to claim of the Father his rights of mercy, which he hath upon the children of men? For he hath answered the ends of the law. A person answers to the justice of God in one of two ways. One, perfect obedience to the law, which leads to blessings and joy. Or two, disobedience to the law, which leads to suffering and punishment and requires a payment or penalty. Christ answered on both counts. He kept the law perfectly. In addition, he pays the penalty for our sins, which payment becomes efficacious as we repent and trust in him. And he claimeth all those who have faith in him, and they who have faith in him will cleave unto every good thing. Wherefore he advocateth the cause of the children of men, and he dwelleth eternally in the heavens. Mormon is essentially asking, since the atonement has been wrought, the greatest miracle in time or eternity, have miracles ceased, or has Jesus ceased to minister to us? And that was by Millet and McConkie. Verse 29, And because he hath done this, my beloved brethren, have miracles ceased, Behold, I say unto you, Nay, neither have angels ceased to minister unto the children of men. John Taylor said, The angels are our watchmen. Angels ward off evil. One might as well undertake to throw the water out of this world into the moon with a teaspoon as to do away with the supervision of angels upon the human mind. They are the police of heaven and report whatever transpires on earth and carry the petitions and supplications of men, women, and children to the mansions of remembrance, where they are kept as tokens of obedience by the sanctified in golden vials labeled the prayers of the saints. Notwithstanding our enemies were, con were continually breathing threats of violence, we did not fear, neither did we hesitate. God was with us, and the angels went before us, and the faith of our little band was unwavering. We know that angels were our companions, for we saw them. And that was by Joseph Smith. Verse 30, For behold, they are subject unto him to minister according to the word of his command, showing themselves unto them of strong faith and a firm mind in every form of godliness. Angels are the servants of Christ. They are heavenly messengers sent by the Lord to minister to men and women on earth. They, their ministry is not capricious, their service not haphazard. They labor under the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. Their ministry, whether seen or unseen, is to those of strong faith. And that was by Millet McConkie. Joseph F. Smith said, When messengers are sent to minister to the inhabitants of this earth, they are not strangers, but from the ranks of our kindred, friends, and fellow beings, and fellow servants. Our fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, friends who have passed away from this earth, having been faithful and worthy to enjoy these rights and privileges, may have a mission given them to visit their friends and relatives upon the earth again, bringing from the divine presence messages of love, of warning, of reproof, or instruction to those whom they had learned to love in the flesh. Verse 31, And the office of their ministry is to call men unto repentance, and to fulfill, and to do the work of the covenants of the Father which he hath made unto the children of men, to prepare the way among the children of men by declaring the word of Christ unto the chosen vessels of the Lord, that they may bear testimony of him. And by so doing, the Lord God prepareth the way that the residue of men may have faith in Christ, that the Holy Ghost may have place in their hearts according to the power thereof. And after this manner bringeth to pass the Father the covenants which he hath made unto the children of men. And Christ hath said, If ye will have faith in me, ye shall have power to do whatsoever thing is expedient in me. And, he's, and he hath said, Repent, all ye ends of the earth, and come unto me, and be baptized in my name, and have faith in me that ye may be saved. And now, my beloved brethren, if this be the case, that these things are true, which I have spoken unto you, and God will show unto you with power and great glory at the last day that they are true, and if they are true, has the day of miracles ceased? Or have angels ceased to appear unto the children of men? Or has he withheld the power of the Holy Ghost from them? Or will he, so long as time shall last, or the earth shall stand, or there shall be one man upon the face thereof to be saved? Christ would have suffered all he did, even for just one of us. 
Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for it is by faith that miracles are wrought, and it is by faith that angels appear and minister unto men. Wherefore, if these things have ceased, woe be unto the children of men, for it is because of unbelief, and all is vain. For no man can be saved according to the words of Christ, save they shall have faith in his name. Wherefore, if these things have ceased, then has faith ceased also. And awful is the state of man, for they are as though there had been no redemption made. Remember that Mormon is giving this talk during the time of the Nephites' greatest wickedness, uh, just prior to their entire destruction. And so he knows of what he speaks. 39. But behold, my beloved brethren, I judge better things of you, for I judge that ye have faith in Christ because of your meekness. For if ye have not faith in him, then ye are not fit to be numbered among the people of his church. And again, my beloved brethren, I would speak unto you concerning hope, how it is that ye can attain unto faith, save ye shall have hope. And what is, the, what is it that ye shall hope for? Behold, I say unto you, that ye shall have hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection, to be raised unto life eternal, and this because of your faith in him according to the promise. Wherefore, if a man have faith, he must needs have hope, for without faith there cannot be any hope. Faith and hope are closely tied. In one sense, a type of hope, what Alma called a desire to believe, precedes faith. That is to say, before faith in Christ can be firmly established, one must begin with some kind of desire to believe. Then, as a person gains the quiet assurance that there is a God, gains a correct understanding of the nature and perfection of God, and gains the assurance from the Lord that his course in life is approved, he is on the pathway of faith. When one has faith in Christ, trust in his almighty power to forgive and lift and lighten and transform the soul, one begins to gain that hope which comes only as a result of believing in and relying upon the merits and mercy of Christ. Hope, in this sense, is not a weak and whimpering yearning that lacks even the beginning of assurance. It is not expressed in such thoughts as, I hope I get to, I get to heaven one day, or I hope the Lord will forgive my sins or I hope there's a place for people like me in the celestial kingdom. Rather, to have hope in Christ is to have the peaceful assurance that one is on course, the quiet confidence that in general terms the Lord is pleased with one's efforts, the anticipation of happiness here and glory and honor hereafter. Alma encouraged his people to live in such a way as to allow the Spirit of the Lord to cleanse and direct them, and thus, he le and thus be led by the Holy Spirit, becoming humble, meek, submissive, patient, full of love and all long suffering, having faith on the Lord, having a hope that ye shall receive eternal life. Verse 43, And again, behold, I say unto you that, ye cannot, that he cannot have faith and hope, save he shall be meek and lowly of heart. If so, his faith and hope is vain, for none is acceptable before God, save the, the meek and lowly in heart. And if a man be meek and lowly in heart and confess, confesses by the power of the Holy Ghost that Jesus is the Christ, he must needs have charity. For if he have not charity, he is nothing. Wherefore, he must needs have charity. Another scripture mastery verse coming up. 45. And, the char and charity suffereth long and is kind and envieth not and is not puffed up, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil and rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Elder McConkie said, Both Paul and Mormon expounded with great inspiration about faith, hope, and charity in many verses but using the same words and phrases. If there is any difference between them, it is that Mormon expounds the doctrines more perfectly and persuasively than does Paul. It does not take much insight to know that Mormon and Paul both had before them the writings of some Old, Old Testament prophet on the same subjects. Verse 46, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, if ye have not charity, ye are nothing, but charity never faileth. Wherefore, cleave unto charity, which is the greatest of all, for all things must fail. But charity is the pure love of Christ. Hugh Nibley said, Charity gives to those who don't deserve and expects nothing in return. It is the love God has for us and the love we have for little children, of whom we expect nothing, but for whom we would give everything. Continuing verse 47, and, and it endureth forever, and whoso is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with him. Above all the attributes of godliness and perfection, charity is the one most devoutly to be desired. Charity is more than love, far more. It is everlasting love, perfect love, the pure love of Christ, which endureth forever. It is love so centered in righteousness that the possessor has no aim or desire except for the eternal welfare of his own soul and for the souls of those around him. And that was by Bruce R. McConkie. Concluding the chapter, verse 48, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart, that ye may be filled with this love. In other words,
towards his love for us, which he hath bestowed upon all who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, for that, he, that we may have this hope, that we may be purified even as he is pure. Amen. Christ carries the scars and wounds from his crucifixion. Maybe we too will carry our scars that were necessary to keep the commandments. Maybe we will be like him in our small versions of suffering. I bear testimony that these things are true, that as we practice faith, hope, and charity, and live more closely to the example that Jesus has, that we can become more like him uh, every day. And I bear that testimony in Jesus Christ. Amen. See you next time.